In this lecture, we'll be discussing DNA replication. In order to understand where DNA replication fits into the physiology of the cell, we first have to understand something about the cell cycle. This is the cycle that dividing cells go through in producing daughter cells from parent cells. It basically consists of five phases. There's what we call G1, which is a gap phase. This is the, the period of time in which the cell is preparing for DNA synthesis. Then there's the S phase, in which the, the cell is actively undergoing DNA replication, and the DNA is being completely copied into two different copies, one of which will go into each daughter cell. The next phase is G2, or the second gap phase, and this is the period in which the cell is preparing for cell division. And then there's the M phase, or the mitotic phase, in which the cell is actively dividing and growing into two different daughter cells. Now there's a fifth phase that arises from the gap one, or G1 phase, and this is the G0 phase. This is a quiescent phase in which there's no active replication of DNA or cell division going on. Most terminally differentiated cells in an organism are found in this G0 phase. Now we're going to spend the time, all of our time in this lecture talking about S phase and the process by which um, cells divide and, and replicate their DNA. DNA replication is what we refer to as a semi-conservative process. Now you can imagine if you're going to make two copies of two strands of DNA that you could do that in a number of different ways. You could make two daughter cells, one of which consists of the parental DNA and one of which consists of two strands of daughter DNA. We call that a conservative process. Or you can use a dispersive process in which the daughter and parental DNA are completely mixed together with one another, and each strand consists of some daughter and some parental um, DNA. Or you could consider a semi-conservative process in which each daughter molecule of DNA consists of one strand of parental DNA and one strand of, da of daughter DNA. In this case, in the case of all um, living organisms, this DNA replication is a semi-conservative process such as I've just described. Now, DNA replication itself is a five-step process. The first step um, is the unwinding of the DNA. The DNA helix has to be unwound. The hydrogen bonds, which bind the nucleotides together, have to be broken. This allows access of the replication machinery to the DNA. Now, DNA unwinding is catalyzed by specialized enzymes that are called DNA helicases. And this is important because local unwinding of the DNA can cause overwinding, or what we call supercoiling, downstream. You can imagine if you've ever wound a rubber band and you've tried to pull it apart, that the section that you pull apart pulls apart easily, but further down you get super winding or over winding of that same uh, rubber band. And that's the same thing that happens in DNA replication. So you, in order to prevent this, there are specialized proteins called DNA topoisomerases. And as indicated in the, in the schematic that you see on this slide, these DNA topoisomerases create strand breaks within the DNA and allow the DNA to be uncoiled after which the strands are re-annealed. And this prevents this overwinding or supercoiling of the DNA downstream from a site of replication. There are two types of topoisomerases. Topoisomerase 1 makes single-stranded breaks, and topoisomerase 2 makes double-stranded breaks. The details of this are beyond the scope of this review, but it's important to realize that there are two kinds and the mechanisms are slightly different. Now there's a clinical correlation here. If there is a situation, for example, that we wanted to kill um, cells that are dividing, for example, cancer cells, then it would be helpful if we could inhibit these topoisomerase 2 molecules to prevent DNA replication. That's exactly what is done in certain chemotherapeutic drugs. There are topoisomerase 2 inhibitors, drugs such as etoposide. These are used as chemotherapeutic agents, and what they do is they inhibit the topoisomerases. This blocks the unwinding of the DNA and prevents DNA replication and DNA synthesis. If the cells are unable to divide, replicate their DNA, then they can't grow and divide. And so this effectively kills or prevents the um, division, the growth and division of cancer cells. Now the second step of DNA replication, once we've unwound the double helix and broken those hydrogen bonds, is that we have to make RNA primers. Now the reason that we have to make RNA primers is that the DNA polymerases, those enzymes which are responsible for DNA replication, can't begin replication de novo. They can't begin replication without a previous 3' hydroxyl group present. And so the 3' hydroxyl group is provided by an RNA primer, which is complementary to the DNA sequence that's being replicated. And this primer is created by a, an enzyme called RNA primase. In mammalian cells, this RNA primase is part of DNA polymerase alpha, which we'll describe in just a few minutes. 
Here's a schematic of the RNA primers being made and base paired to one of the strands of the DNA. The third step is that DNA polymerase, now starting at the 3' hydroxyl group from that RNA primer, begins to extend the polymer in the 5' to 3' direction, adding new base paired nucleotides as it goes along. If this 5' to 3' synthesis of DNA expands towards the replication fork, that site at which the DNA is being unwound, we call this the leading strand. The other strand, which we call the lagging strand, is that strand of DNA which is proceeding in the 5' to 3' direction away from the replication fork, or in the opposite direction of the replication fork. This has to be polymerized discontinuously because you can see that each fragment runs into the previous one and you have to start a new fragment behind it. These little fragments that form as a consequence of this problem are called Okazaki fragments. Now, DNA polymerase catalyzes the formation of phosphodiester bonds between the 5' phosphate of a deoxynucleotide triphosphate, or DNTP, and the 3' hydroxyl group of the growing strand of DNA. Energy for the formation of this phosphodiester bond comes from the release of pyrophosphate, which is two phosphate molecules bound to each other from the de deoxynucleotide triphosphate. Further energy is produced by breaking this pyrophosphate into two molecules of inorganic phosphate. And the energy required to form this DNA strand then is provided by those high energy bonds in the deoxynucleotide triphosphate. Now what are the enzymes that perform all these procedures? Well, in prokaryotic cells, which are like bacteria, there are three different DNA polymerases, and we call them DNA polymerase 1, DNA polymerase 2, and DNA polymerase 3. DNA polymerase 1 is a, uh, a polymerase which degrades the RNA primers as they're formed and fills in the gaps, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. DNA polymerase 2, in addition uh, to synthesizing DNA, participates in DNA repair. It helps to fix the DNA if there's a mistake in replication, and we'll describe more of that later as well. DNA polymerase 3 is the workhorse of prokaryotic replication. It does most of the synthesis and also the proofreading of DNA replication. In eukaryotic cells, by contrast, there are five different DNA polymerases, and they perform different functions that are involved in DNA replication. Most of the DNA replication is performed by polymerase alpha, which uh, is the, the polymerase which uh, contains the RNA primase, forms the RNA primer, and does all of the initial DNA synthesis. The rest of the majority of DNA synthesis on both the leading and the lagging strands is performed by polymerase delta. Polymerase beta and polymerase epsilon both function in DNA repair, which we'll describe in a different lecture. Polymerase gamma is unique in that it's responsible for replicating the DNA that's found in the genomes of the mitochondria, which are intracellular organelles. The fourth step of DNA replication is the degradation of the RNA primers. Remember that in, a, in the final product, we need to have no RNA in, in these chromosomes. We have to have all DNA. And so the polymerase degrades the RNA primers um, using a what we call a 5' to 3' exonuclease. And what that means is that it degrades the primers by taking off the nucleotides from the 5' end sequentially towards the 3' end. The resulting space from the degradation of the RNA primers is filled in then by a DNA polymerase. And that occurs uh, both on the leading and the lagging strand. The last step is that DNA ligase joins the ends of the fragments together, either the ends of Okazaki fragments on the lagging strand or the ends of a leading strand as it reaches another replication fork. This process continues until we've been, uh, duplicated or replicated the entire strand to form two identical daughter strands. Now you can imagine in a chromosome, a human chromosome, which is billions of base pairs long, that it would take a long time to replicate DNA if we only did it from a single replication fork. Well, to avoid that problem, we actually start replication at a number of different sites, um, thousands, millions probably, of different sites along the chromosome. And the sites at which this replication is um, initiated are called origins of replication. And they're shown in the schematic to the right of this slide. From each origin of replication, a replication fork proceeds in either direction um, until they meet or until they reach the end of the chromosome. So you can see that at, at each replication fork, then we have a leading and a lagging strand. And these um, replication forks proceed then until they meet each other. The ends are, are uh, bonded together by DNA ligase, and we end up with two continuous uh, double-stranded DNA daughter chromosomes. 
Now, the ends of each chromosome have specialized structures at them, and these specialized structures are called telomeres. Telomeres are repetitive sequences that are found at the end of the chromosomes. When we say repetitive, what we mean is that there's a six base pair pattern. Um, in the case of human telomeres, it's uh, TTAGGG that's repeated thousands of times over and over again. These sequences are synthesized by an enzyme which is called telomerase. And the length of these repeats shortens each time the chromosome is replicated. These telomeres function to protect the ends of the chromosomes um, from degradation. Every time we, we replicate the DNA, though, we, we miss out on replicating some of those sequences right at the end of the chromosomes. So every time a cell divides, the telomeres get progressively shorter and shorter until they reach a point which they can no longer protect the chromosome from degradation. Therefore, the, the shortening of these telomeres is believed to be involved in cellular senescence or cellular aging, um, in which the cells, the lifespan of the cells is controlled by the length of their telomeres. It's thought that in many cancers, in which the cells um, just continue to grow on forever and ever, that the telomerase is reactivated, maintaining the length of these telomeres, so that the normal cellular senescence does not occur. We have for you now a practice question to test how well you've understood the concepts that we've taught you so far about DNA replication. What we show here is a parental DNA sequence from 5' prime to 3', prime, A, C, C, T, A, G, A, C, T, T, A, G. Which of the following sequences below, listed A through D, is the correctly replicated daughter strand? Is it A, B, C, or D? The correct answer is B, CTA, AGT, CTA, GGT. The important concept in trying to answer a question like that, this, is to remember that DNA is always anti-parallel and complementary. And so the daughter strand will always have the complementary sequence, but that sequence will be in the opposite direction, as shown below. Now this process of replication is not perfect. The, the replication enzymes, DNA polymerase and others, can make mistakes. In fact, DNA polymerase makes an error about every 10 to the 5th or 10,000 base pairs. Now, this doesn't seem like very often, but if you think about the size of the genome, if you were to make an error every 10 to the 5th base pairs, in replicating a whole genome, which is about 6 times 10 to the 9th base pairs, you would make approximately 60,000 errors. And this is intolerable if we want to maintain a functional organism. Most of these mistakes are mismatches between bases, but they could also be insertions or deletions. Now, if we didn't correct these errors, the cell would not be able to survive because there would be mutations in key proteins. Now, one of the ways that we fix these errors is that the DNA polymerase itself has what we call a 3' prime to 5' prime editing exonuclease activity. What this does is it detects mismatches as they occur, as shown on the right here, it cleaves the offending nucleotide, the mismatched nucleotide, and then replaces it with the correctly base paired nucleotide. And this is a process that occurs coincident or at the same time as DNA replication. This editing exonuclease activity reduces the error rate by approximately 100 fold to about 1 in 10 to the 7th or 1 in 10 million base pairs. Now, there's an additional proofreading step that takes place after this that, that is independent of the replication machinery, but occurs before cell division. And this reduces the final error rate to about 1 times 10 to the 9th base pairs. So instead of having 60,000 errors every time we replicate the genome, now we only have approximately 6 errors every time the genome is replicated. And in most cases, this is a tolerable level of error. Now, again, we can use... Um, a little clinical correlation here that has to do with DNA replication. Again, we can use the fact that the DNA re replication machinery uses nucleotides, which are base paired and have to bond to the previous nucleotide in, in order for a cell to divide. We can use that concept, again, to prevent the DNA division, DNA synthesis and cell division of cells that are growing because they're cancerous or because they're viruses or something else. For example, we can use a, a compound called cytosine aribinoside or ARIS-C, which converts a deoxyribonucleoside in cytosine to another sugar, arabinose, which, which blocks um, the DNA synthesis. And this prevents cells from growing. We use this as a chemotherapeutic drug to treat cancer. Another thing that we can do is we can remove the 3' hydroxyl group. You can imagine if you don't have a 3' hydroxyl group then, that you can't bond the 5' phosphate of another trinucleotide 
um, to it. And this is a, an example of this is 2 prime, 3 prime deoxyinosine or DDI. This is a drug that we use to treat HIV. Um, without the 3 prime hydroxyl group, the virus cannot replicate itself, um, and it, it, it halts and it doesn't divide or continue to grow. Another example is uh, a drug we call zidovidine or AZT. In this case, we've replaced the 3 prime prime hydroxyl group with an azide group or an N3 group. Again, this blocks replication and prevents the virus, in this case HIV, from replicating properly um, and halts it in its progress. This concludes the lecture on DNA replication.